Access to an innovation, a medical innovation, created dramatically different outcomes for two branches of my family, forever changing the trajectory of their futures, and I'd like to share their story with you today. Let me introduce you to my two grandmothers, Diana, my Indian Jewish maternal grandmother, and Bhagirati, my Brahmin Hindu paternal grandmother. Both were born in India in the late 19th century. Their lives in the early 1900s ran in parallel up to a point, but ended very differently. Bhagirati, my paternal grandmother, was married in her early teens to a kind, educated man who earned his living working in a local government printing press in a small town in central India. Diana, my maternal grandmother, completed her schooling through high school and was married soon after to an educated man who taught in a local college in Bombay City. Neither family was wealthy, and each had to struggle to make ends meet. Bhagirati gave birth to 10 infants, only six of whom survived, and had several other unsuccessful pregnancies over a span of 20 years. Worn out and depleted with the multiple pregnancies and continuous loss and sorrow, in 1932, my paternal grandmother, Bhagirati, succumbed to, to, to tuberculosis and died at the age of 33. Her eldest daughter also died of TB at the age of 14, having contracted the infection while taking care of her ailing mother. Diana, much like Bhagirati, had multiple pregnancies closely spaced. She gave birth to six babies in the course of the first seven years of her married life, one of whom died in infancy. However, in 1932, the year that Bhagirati died, Diana's husband Moses, using the access that he had to social and professional networks that exist in a large metropolis like Bombay and that characterize the world of an educated man, managed to secure a vasectomy, a new medical innovation not yet approved, yet available to some in India. This ended Diana's cycle of repeated pregnancies. She went on to complete a college education and establish and run a school of her own for poor Indian, and, uh, Indian Jewish and Muslim children in, in her city of Bombay. Diana instilled in her students and her own children the highest respect for education, and each one of her five children, sons and daughters alike, went on to complete professional degrees and reach the highest rungs of their respective professions. What became of Bhagirati's family? For one, they forever lost the potential that Bhagirati and her daughter offered. Her husband, my grandfather, never fully recovered his potential after his wife's and daughter's untimely deaths. Only two of Bhagirati's daughters were able to complete school and become financially independent. The other two were not as lucky, and their futures remained forever limited by that fact. The only son, my father, by virtue of the privilege given to men, had the opportunity to complete school, then college, and went on to join the Indian Navy and travel to distant shores. His travels at some point led him to my late mother, Sarah, a physician. My siblings and I were the beneficiaries of my parents' education and vast professional experience, among many other invaluable gifts. Of Bhagirati's other grandchildren, those that did well are the ones whose mother was fortunate to receive an education. The others continued to struggle, suffered ill health, untimely deaths, and despite repeated interventions from us, their children are still unable to break the insidious cycle of intergenerational disadvantage. So we see in this personal anecdote how Moses' access to a relatively simple innovation and his courage to be an early adopter gave Diana increased health, undoubtedly extended her life, and increased the options she had for how to utilize the human and financial capital of her family. Because she chose to pursue a higher education and work, she inspired her children and grandchildren to take their educations and their careers even further. What lessons can be learned from this story about my family? First, innovation does matter. Innovations change individual lives, families' lives, and entire societies, and the ripple effects can be maintained over generations. Second, innovation for economic resilience 
need not necessarily be financial or economic in form. In this story, a medical innovation resulted in economic and social empowerment for Diana and her children and her grandchildren. Third, the diffusion and use of innovations are not inevitable, especially for those who have the least access to education and to financial assets. The contrast between Diana's and Bhagirathi's lives illustrates this fact well. Great ideas are the start, but many other ingredients are required to ensure the accessibility of innovations. In the case of my grandmother Diana, it was her husband's social and professional networks that compensated for his lack of financial resources. In order to understand the necessary ingredients for diffusion and the uptake of a particular innovation, it is of course necessary to consider the end user during the research and the design phase. An innovation that has been repeatedly emphasized in the field of global development for women is the fuel efficient stove, which has important environmental, health and safety implications. However, these stoves have failed to take off in many places because too rarely have women, the primary users of stoves, been consulted during the design or the development of the distribution strategy for those stoves. As a result, many women have found them very difficult to procure or to use, and I can attest to that from my own personal experience of trying to use one such innovative stove as a newly married bride in India. We cannot afford to take for granted that women, especially poor women, have the same access to resources as men would. I want to encourage all of you, no matter what your ideas and innovations are, or where you plan to target them, to ensure that women are included as a key part of your design and distribution strategy. Focusing on the usefulness and access of an innovation for women is particularly important if your goal is to end poverty. Because we know that income and resources in the hands of a woman has far-reaching positive economic and social impacts for women themselves, their children, and the communities in which they live, and thus can be an engine for poverty reduction and economic growth. Motivated by this knowledge, Ila Bhatt, the founder of the Self-Employed Women's Association in India, created an economic innovation, what we call Microfinance Plus, that transformed the lives of millions of poor women in India and catalyzed a global movement that trusted the poor, particularly women, to be good and reliable borrowers. By combining access to loans and financial services with efforts to ensure that the rights, health, and social concerns of the most disadvantaged women were met, Ila Bhatt the, and the more than million women members who were central to the diffusion of her model spawned a revolution. I want us all to be inspired by Ila Bhatt's success and by Diana's and Moses' courage as we discuss and applaud the various innovations we will hear about today. They, like the innovators here today, refuse to be limited by the constraints of their societies or conventional thinking. And in memory of my grandmother Bhagirathi, who I never knew, I applaud your efforts to maximize every individual's potential and look forward to learning much more from you today. Thank you very much.